TV. Uh, no, ladies and gentlemen, your eyes are not deceiving you. The title of this show is Improving the Effectiveness of Our Name Calling. After all, I am an evangelist. It has been said that I'm the most effective evangelist in modern times. I can't deny it, but it's because I follow the rules of evangelism that I realized fully in 1996, and I started a series called Exposure and Rebuke, and I took a lot of heat because people were a little skittish about insulting anyone, and people were too nice, and so effective evangelism comes on the heels of effective exposure and rebuke. And effective exposure and rebuke comes on the heels of top-notch, uh, super inventive, highly creative and cutting name-calling. Yes, we must perfect our name-calling, but um, if, if you don't want to do it, I understand that. There are many people who are squeamish, who don't want to make waves. Um, Believe it or not, I don't like to make waves, but I will make waves because it's my job. And I'm going to explain to you how I'm going to improve my name calling. I'm going to Im improve the exposure and rebuke I indulge in so that I may improve the number of people who come to the evangel, the number of people who hear the evangel, the number of people who reject the falsehoods because the falsehoods cannot be rejected unless they are soundly, soundly blown up soundly um 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 let's say crashed the false teachings must crash into the side of a mountain they must explode into a million pieces via dynamite they must be put into a hot air balloon and have that hot air balloon launched over the mojave desert and then having the hot air balloon shot down with a shoulder-launched bazooka. So, this is the example of Jesus and Paul. The reason I'm bringing this up, first of all, I must thank Catherine of Redmond, Washington, who sent me help for my troubled throat. She sent me Meta, Meta Herb, a company called Meta Herb. This is Herbal Throat Spray. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to, I'm getting it already. You can hear my throat kind of getting a little rough already because it knows I'm going to be talking about improving the quality of our name calling. And so my throat is rebelling, but uh, I'm going to conquer it with Meta Herb Herbal Throat Spray. This is the spray that I, Martin Zender, use to keep my voice silky smooth and properly insulting the Monsters of the Christian religion. Oh, I just called them monsters. That's a good start. It said four. I put three. Ah, let's go for it. I was entertained by my own video yesterday. I had not seen that video on from Richmond, Virginia, walking into the next eon, something like that, doing something into the next eon, skipping, hopping, jumping, walking, passing. I, I forget. But there was a real part in there that was really, really funny, and I had not seen it until I, since I had made it, and it was, um, it was answering the common objection to the salvation of all, and this is the common objection. It wasn't launched by anyone at that conference, of course, but it's that you mean to tell me Hitler's gonna be where I am someday, right? This is usually the voice in which this this insane little self-righteous opposition to the truth is launched. So I thought I was kind of funny on the video when I said, I answered this hypothetical person and I said, this person who says, why are you telling me Hitler? You know if Hitler's going to be where I am someday? I said, oh, don't worry. Probably after a couple months Hitler will learn how to put up with you you self-righteous bitch Ooh, is this still a family show well a bitch is a female dog but it is also a rather harsh sharp 
name to call a woman who is a little maybe shrewish. Oh, shrew itself is a pretty tough word there. But we need to gauge the degree of the assault on the truth. And when someone, I mean, th this Hitler thing is so illustrative of the problem in Christianity, the problem of self-righteousness, that they claim to be saved by grace, right? They claim that God loves the world, and they claim that it's not to their credit that they're going to heaven. And yet, at the same time, when you mention the fact that in the fullness of times, Adolf Hitler will enjoy the salvation that Jesus Christ won for him at Calvary, they say something like that. Oh my God, Hitler's going to be with me. And boom. See, they let their self-righteousness come out. They forget to put a guard on it. They usually try to hide it, whitewash it, and then it just comes out that they really think they're better than Hitler. And that is ugly. That is the most heinous sin in Scripture, in the world, is self-righteousness. It's the most heinous sin. And when it comes up, it needs to be called out. Comes up, called out. But And so I would not now I would not hesitate to call someone a self-righteous bitch because it will make waves but I'll tell you the only circumstance in which I would do it again you have to be very careful here I'm here I'm also giving you advice on how to use name calling this is when you don't use it you do not use and I'm gonna give you examples I'm following Jesus and Paul Paul said become imitators of me he called he called people uh, dogs he called them the main decision he called them idol bellies uh, he called them whitewashed walls he called them son of the adversary Jesus called people vipers um, hypocrites these are hard terms and we don't realize how hard they really were because it's in the Bible and so it sounds holy almost holy to us well the King James says brood of vipers it almost sounds elegant it almost sounds something like you would have your grandmother knit a needlepoint and put it on the wall frame it and put it on the wall a brood of vipers it's become too acceptable that's the problem paul calls the circumcision curs a cur is a dog you might as well say bitch you might as well say bitch i'm sorry so paul really sets the table here for us paul paves the way by calling the circumcision dogs beware of dogs don't you mean the circumcision? No, I mean dogs. It's harsh. It's very harsh. And for that reason, it arrested the attention. This is the purpose. We're not going to do this randomly. We're not going to do this out of anger. We're going to do it out of a self-righteous, uh, not a self-righteous, but um, a justified indignation upon the sin of self-righteousness. We're going to call people out. I'm going to tell you how to do it, I'm going to tell you where to do it, and I'm going to tell you how I would do it. And then I'm going to get to these some of these specific names used by our heroes, Jesus Christ and Paul. And whenever they used these names, there was in the wake belief. Belief followed because these brave men took on the enemies. They took on the adversaries of God, and it's like the the modern day grace equivalent of putting a rock through the forehead of of goliath now that's kind of rude isn't it why don't we just send goliath to the corner for some corner time why don't we just say no dinner for you goliath because you taunted the armies of israel that wasn't nice go to your room that wasn't nice how about some corner time no goliath gets a rock through his forehead that's the way men of god take down the adversary but this is an era of grace. Yes, but it's not an era of nice. Who was the captain of grace? Who was the who was Mr. Grace? Okay, it was Paul. And here's this guy calling people dogs, idle bellies, son of the devil, and so and walls. Paul called somebody a wall. I love this. He said, "You wall." That's that's so brutal. I might start using that. You wall. It just sounds so degrading on the wall. I mean, it almost sounds worse than calling somebody a moron or an idiot because we're so used to those. What a jerk. What a moron. What an idiot. When you call somebody, what a wall. Ooh, God, that's dirty. And that's effective. You see, because wall hasn't been overused. These other terms have been overused. You can even call somebody an MF-er. I don't recommend that one. It's too crass. 
I'm talking about elegant name calling here. Elegant name calling, yet yeah, effective name calling. But back to the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to arrest the attention, to stun the listener. And this gives you a clue as to the the arena in which this can be deployed. This is any uh, technique that is deployed. And I will tell you how I will deploy the term self-righteous bitch. I will deploy it, God willing, and I will tell you how and when should the occasion arise. And I guarantee you that if the occasion I'm thinking about were ever to happen, and if I were to use self-righteous bitch i guarantee you that what would follow would be a great move of interest in the evangel of paul guarantee to you why <laughs> because i'm following the instructions expose rebuke and entreat and i'm becoming imitators of my heroes paul and jesus if it was a man if it was a man i'd probably say um, you can't call a man a bitch, but that would be really kind of insulting. Ooh, no, no. Uh, I would say, uh, pompous, self-righteous ass. Yeah, I will call a man a selfish, uh, pompous, self-righteous ass for sure. All right, well, let's go to the scripture. Um, Catherine, I don't know about this stuff. I'm not, is this a long-term thing? Catherine of Med of Redmond, Washington. Like, if I am I supposed to take this every day, and it's supposed to gradually improve it? Maybe, maybe I'm applying it wrong. Maybe I'm thinking it as sort of an instant relief thing of some magic silver bullet, right? Five sprays. Okay, all right. Now, I really don't need to go to these passages because you are all familiar with them. But I do want to bring up the an important one: the maim scission. Um, in Matthew 23, of course, Jesus Christ calling the Pharisees blind. That's pretty insulting. That's uh, Matthew 23, 24, calls them blind guides. He accuses them of cleaning the outside of the cup and the plate, yet inside they're brimming with rapacity and incontinence. Uh, that's, those are pretty un good, unused words that have not lost their punch. You people are so rapacious and incontinent. But nobody knows what those mean nowadays because people are dumbed down, so you're better off using bitch. Um, blind Pharisee, yes, of course, good one. Hypocrites, good one, good one. In, in verse 27, Jesus says, you are resembling the whitewashed sepulchers. I don't, I don't like that as much. You are resembling. It's more like a simile. You guys are kind of remind me of oh, like a whitewashed wall. You guys kind of remind me of a snake. Now, it's much more effective to turn that into a metaphor and saying, you are a sepulcher. You are, oh, here it is. And verse 33 of Matthew 23, serpents, progeny of vipers, progeny of vipers. This is, you can't imagine, you cannot imagine. Again, this sounds holy almost because it's in the scriptures, but you cannot imagine the effect this had. And Jesus always did this publicly and there's a reason for that. And I'm going to explain it to you. And this is going to either improve your evangelism, that is, if you want it improved, or it will cause you to understand my um, upscaled, my new and improved evangelism. Like, why is Martin Zender calling people pompous, self-righteous asses? Well, because then you hear he's trying to improve and upgrade his name calling so as to further the fame of the gospel. Oh, no, I didn't hear that. I'll watch his show, and you'll find out why. And you'll find out who in whose footsteps he's following. Pro why, why a serpent and then a progeny of vipers? Progeny, that's really insulting. Progeny of vipers. Think of it. What Jesus is saying is two vipers got together, a male and a female viper. And they had sex. And the male viper implanted viper sperm into the female viper uterus. And the female viper, like, laid eggs. And they came out in a lot of slime. And then those eggs incubated. And then they cracked open and all these slimy little vipers came out. 
That's what he called the Pharisees. The Pharisees who thought that they were the people and wisdom died with them. So a progeny of vipers, like a brood, like a bunch of viper children. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. Viper children. Hey, viper children. That's good. Ooh, viper children. Write that down. Viper children. It's kind of it's a variation on a theme. I'm going to write that down, put that in my vocabulary, in my arsenal. Viper children. All right, let's move on to Acts 13. I love this one. I brought it to you many times. Paul and Barnabas are in Salamis on the island of Cyprus, I, I believe here, and they encounter a magician, a false prophet, Bar-Jesus. They're trying to take the evangel to this poor guy named Sergius Paulus, who's the proconsul of Cyprus. It's not working very well. Uh, now, the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, is a an intelligent man, and he can think for himself. This guy wants to believe, but he's withstood by, he has this guy in his office, in his services, this magician. It's a Jewish guy named Bar Jesus. And he withstands the pro-council, starts saying bad things about Paul and Barnabas and Saul at the time. Um, he's withstanding Saul and Barnabas, seeking to pervert the pro-council from the faith. We're getting into now the environment in which this name-calling, this new and improved name-calling should be deployed. It is deployed against anyone seeking to pervert other people from receiving the truth. So Paul, Saul, who is also Paul, this is significant because this is where his name is changed from Saul to Paul. It's in verse 9 of Acts 13, being filled with Holy Spirit, looking intently at Bar-Jesus, says, O oh, full of all guile and all knavery, son of the adversary, enemy of all righteousness. Then he blinds the guy, which is a nice flourish. It's a nice touch. I can't do that. Paul had this apostolic uh, gift at, at the time. And he was, the, of course, the inaugurator. And we saw miracles happening here because it was the early stages of Paul's message. So these miracles and signs helped Paul's message get a leg up on the competition. And so Paul could blind people. I can't. I would if I could, but I can't. And so I will, in, in, in lieu of blinding people, see, I have to now increase the intensity of my name calling because I can't blind people. But I like this son of the adversary, son of the, the devil. This is the same type thing where the devil had sex with a devilette and they produced devil children out of the uterus of the devilette. This is all very hideous. Just I don't even, I'm sorry to even say this. I hope the kids aren't really paying too much attention at this point. And they produced an offspring and it was... And it was Bar Jesus, son of the adversary. Do you know why Martin Luther is famous today? Do you know why he had such an effect? Do you know why the Reformation followed on the heels of Martin Luther? Because he perfected name calling. And if you any cursory investigation into Martin Luther will show you that the man perfected name calling, and he wrote cartoons. It's a cartoon of Satan, uh, this is, uh, you can't make this up, Satan in this cartoon drawn by Martin Luther, which I'm sure, sure circulated underground, Martin Luther probably had a newsletter, and of course he was against the Catholic Church, anyway, in this cartoon, uh, it was, Satan was taking a crap, and the crap was the Pope, the Pope was coming out of Satan's ass, this is Martin Luther, he had a cartoon, of Satan squatting to take a dump, and out from Satan's ass comes the Pope. You can't make this up. That is why the Reformation started, probably. And tacking those 95 theses, is that how many they were, on the wall of Wittenberg, on the door of Wittenberg Chapel, whatever it was. And I'm sure they had some choice words. Uh, Martin Luther was not lacking for choice words. He was a very earthy man, to say the least. Um, he was kind of like the Trump of the Reformation. He, he's, he was the Trump of the rebellion against the Catholic Church. He just said what he thought, and he drew cartoons that so startled people that they said, have you seen this? OMG. Did you see Luther's latest cartoon? Look at this. What 
Oh, I got to copy that. Show that to my sister. Holy smokes. And it got copied around. That's how these things happen. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right, now we go to Acts. And what is happening here is Paul is in a trial in Jerusalem. And he's standing before the Sanhedrin. And Paul says to the Sanhedrin, this is after he's been accused of bringing, bringing Trophimus into the sanctuary, I think. Yeah, there's a bunch of trouble brewing in Paul's wake here. He says, Men, brethren, I in all good conscience have used my citizenship for God until this day. Now, uh, the chief priest Ananias didn't take too kindly to that statement for whatever reason, and he enjoins those standing beside Paul to beat his mouth. That, that's rude. Okay, I'm not promoting any violence here. I'm just promoting clever insults, clever names that illustrate something that are purposeful, that are intelligent, that are useful. And I'm going to get to that. I hope I have time when I get to the term maim scission. It's coming up. Oh, 21 minutes. Okay, shoot. Okay, here we go. I think I can do it. So they beat Paul and Paul said to him, God is about to beat you, whitewashed wall. Oh, God is about to beat you, whitewashed wall. There's where Paul calls him a wall. A whitewashed wall. I would have preferred just a plain wall, but whitewashed wall, yes, it's more picturesque, but wall is more like devastatingly erudite. It's um, it's horrifyingly punctuated by an impressive lack of verbiage. It is, um, yeah, and other things. So, Paul recanted of it only because those standing by said, the chief priest of God you're reviling. You're saying this to the chief priest of God. And Paul said, oops, sorry, I was not aware that he was a chief priest. I don't know why he wasn't aware. Maybe he didn't know who said it. I don't know. For it is written, and he quotes the law that says, don't, don't cuss out the chief priest. So that's the only reason Paul recanted of it. Otherwise, it was a great insult. And it's recorded in Scripture for a reason. Here we go. Philippians I won't probably, maybe not get past Philippians. I'll go to Titus tomorrow, maybe. I'll just sew up some loose ends tomorrow. Philippians 3, Paul talks about, he says concerning the circumcision, Paul really despised the circumcision because they came in to the people, to the Greeks. Paul was freeing from all this idolatry, freeing from, if any of the Greeks were dabbling in Israel things, and some of them were, because just like some people dabble in Israel things today, non-Israelites like to dabble in Israel things today because they like people like religion, they like ceremonies, they like rites, they like festivals, they like feasts, they like to observe things. Okay, so some of the early Greeks were like that too. And so when the circumcisionists, those in in Jerusalem, and these were people who believed in Jesus, but they thought they needed to add the law to a belief in Jesus Christ. So these people would come sneak in after Paul left, and they would they would basically try to seduce people into doing the law. Paul called them the circumcisionists. Well, here he says, beware of curse. That's who he's talking about, the circumcisionists, those who would sneak law into grace, those who would try to mix law with grace. Paul says, beware of curse. That is dogs. That is beware of bitches. Beware of the bitches. That's what Paul's saying here. Beware of the bastards and the bitches. Beware of the pompous, self-righteous asses and the self-righteous bitches. Beware. And then he says, beware of the maimcision. I love this. Paul takes a word that means something, circumcision, and he perverts it for his diabolical slash wonderful ends and makes it the maimcision. The maimcision makes up a word. It's an insult, an insulting word. That is, he, what he, he, he's saying is this circumcision, which was this holy thing God gave to Abraham. Paul's now saying that it's worthless because Christ has come and he's fulfilled the law. So now anyone who cuts their flesh around that male reproductive member, it's, you're only maiming it. That's all you're doing. You're just injuring yourself. That's the value of it now. It's an injury. You need a band-aid. You need a bandage. You need to go to the doctor. Okay? So he called it the maimcision. Brutal, brutal satire. Paul is deploying it so well here that, I mean, it's enshrined in the Bible. It's in the Bible, people. In the Bible. So I thought of a couple terms here to mix. A couple of hybrids here I thought were pretty 
interesting. I also took some clues from Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh, I heard him one broadcast talking about uh, people who get sex change operations. He talks about women who want to become men, men who want to become women. And he took this technique Paul is using, that is to make a Frankenstein out of two different terms. He called those um, women who want to become men, he called the operation to make women into men um, adedictomy. Adedictomy. And he called the operation by which men desire to become women, um, the operation was called a take a dick off of me. So we have, we have an, an adedictomy and a take a dick off of me. And those are, those are the proper terms according to Rush Limbaugh. So I thought, what do we call people who believe in hell? How can we up our game in the name calling department to shock people, to cause more people to inquire into the truth? Because that's what it will do. And I'm going to, I'm going to prove that to you because you, you will see that what I say about this, you will go, yes, that's obvious. Wow. Leave it to Zender to, to think of that. But I, I thought people who believe in hell, we should call them maybe hell tards. Hell tards. Of course, it's already politically incorrect to call anybody a retard. Somebody who's like mentally undeveloped is a bad term. I don't use it. But to add hell to it is kind of nice because you are a little mentally slow if you don't know that Jesus never said the word hell, that rather there were three different Greek words translated hell. So anyone who believes in hell is a hell tard. I'm going to start using that term to create more like what? And next, I thought, what do we call Trinitarians? Uh, I first thought like stupidarians, but no, because it doesn't fit the main decision. The main decision, the actual Frankenstein is useful. It, it takes, it's illustrative. It takes another word like maim, because that's what they're doing there, maiming, and adds it to scission, maim scission. So it would have to be something like can't add Atarians. Can't add, right? They say three gods is still one god. One plus one plus one equals one. So can't add Atarian. The can't add Atarians. He's a can't add Atarian. No, he can't add that. thought that was maybe, maybe that'll be good. Not as good as Heltard, but how about this one? For free will, I couldn't think of a word to substitute in there, so I just got, uh, I just come up with free, it's all about me willers. Free willers. Free, it's all about me will. That's the doctrine of free, it's all about me will. Not quite as insulting. I, I, maybe Heltard is the gem out of that litter. Maybe that's the, that's the strongest pup to come out of that litter. So you're welcome to use it anytime so quickly now here is the only way i would call somebody a self-righteous bitch is if i was on national television or any television or radio and other people are are listening i'd rather this be national television i would like to be debating some famous christian on the topic of eternal torment on the topic of the salvation of all it'd be in the talk show format i'm on a panel let's say and and then they start taking questions from the audience. And the, it's live, let's say. And the TV cameras are on. There's a studio audience, maybe 300 people in the studio audience. And they take questions from the audience. They take, some guy takes the microphone around, puts it in front of some lady, and she goes, and this lady says, I can't believe what I'm hearing. You mean to tell me that Adolf Hitler's going to be where I am someday? Posing that objection to me. At that time... I swear to God I will do this because I have all my examples before me. I have Jesus and Paul. I have the knowledge over the last 20 years of what's effective exposure and rebuke. I see how it results. I see where you're supposed to use it in public. I see who you're supposed to use it against, opponents of the truth, the Pharisees, Bar Jesus, the circumcisionists. And I would say at that point, well, I suppose that after a couple months, Hitler will learn to put up with you, you self-righteous bitch. Woo! Son, that would create a firestorm. That would make the news, I'm pretty sure. Um, if it didn't make the news, I would write a press release and make it news. I would put it on YouTube, and I would put it out there because it, like, it's a big show. You know, it's a big show. And some guy, some Christian man who believes in salvation of all, who's supposed to be a wuss. Oh, he believes in the salvation of all. What a wuss. He believes that Jesus is just God and just nice people and they just don't want to condemn anybody. This guy's a wuss. Ho, ho. We'll see about that, you self-righteous. So here's how it works. See, the people who see me 
on the show, they think they're just going to see a typical debate, right, between a mainstream Christian guy and this kid who thinks he knows about Scripture. All right? That's what they're anticipating. Huh. What to their wandering eyes does appear? Huh. Well, a guy who calls a innocent audience member who is really not an innocent audience member because this woman, and God will arrange for it to be a woman, to set me up for my great line. He will arrange for her to say the classic. Because, see, I will set her up for it. I will set her up. I will talk about even Hitler, you see. Oh, yes, even Hitler, in the fullness of times, comes under the saving work of Jesus Christ at the cross. I've just set it up. And now we'll take questions from the audience. And the woman of my dreams will take the microphone and say, Are you telling me that Adolf Hitler is going to be where I am someday? Then I'll say my classic line. You already know what it is. No need to repeat it here. What will that result in? That will result in people watching the show to be shell-shocked. They will be absolutely shell-shocked. It will knock them out of any stupor they might have been in. It will knock them out of any sense of, I know what this guy's going to say, he's another typical Christian. Because Christians don't talk like this. Christians don't call other Christians self-righteous bitches. But I do, because I'm not a Christian. That's what they don't know yet. But they find it out very soon. Very soon they will find out. So then, I'll create a stir. Because the people will say, no man has ever spoken like this. And who have they said that about before? Does that sound familiar? The people said that about our Lord. No man has ever spoken like this. When did they say it? When he started taking their religious leaders to task. That's when they said it. I told you, after exposure and rebuke, great revival follows. People start to want to know what the truth is because of the sharp rebuke. So therefore, people will go, what's this guy's name? Martin Zender. So they will put Martin Zender in the search box of Google and they will find martinsender.com because of what I said, because of me calling this woman a self-righteous bitch. It, it's just shock therapy. It is shock therapy. That's what it is. And I do it with purpose for this very purpose. Cause people to look me up. And when they look me up, they find the truth. And they get the truth and the last member comes into the body of Christ. That's how it's going to work, people. That's how it's going to work.